Good evening, viewers. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we invite you into our presence, wherever we are, participating in Know Your Faith. We thank you for being able to host this series to inform about and spread the Catholic faith to our sisters and brothers. We ask your blessings on our presenter, our listeners, those who facilitate this production, that we may be guided by your Holy Spirit in presenting and receiving your will. We pray that all who benefit come to a deeper understanding and appreciation of the Catholic faith that will guide our living. We make this prayer through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son and our brother. Amen. Amen. Once again, welcome to all our viewers, and I know we've had um, a larger amount of viewers than usual, and we, we thank you and congratulate you for joining the the, the, the faith series. I don't know if it's Father Mike is the attraction or the topic is the attraction. I hope it's both because the topic is important and Father Mike is is um, uh, well versed in the topic, and we thank you for coming in in your larger than normal numbers. Um, we thank those parishes that invited their, their liturgical committees, especially, to participate. I thought that was a, um, a really good move to get those who are involved in um, parts, uh, uh, roles during the Mass to come on board and understand um, more the meaning of the Mass and, and therefore hopefully um, enhance and you know, make your participation more meaningful. So we thank you for that. And um, just to let you know, too, that these um, video recordings are available on the Catholic TT um, site, website, um, and we will try and get that link um, published so that we can and recommend this, the, these recordings to your friends and colleagues in the parish or outside of the parish. So if you recall, these, this is a two, three, week, three session series on the Mass, the Holy Mass, the, on the meaning and understanding, um, this Christian worship, key focus um, worship of Catholics. And uh, the first session, um, Father Mike dealt with the opening, opening um, rites, the, and then the liturgy of the word. And the second session, he dealt with the Eucharist um, and the closing. So what I would ask him to do today, we, we will be dealing with some of the questions, answering some of the questions you, you would have sent um, arising in your minds from the, the last for the last two sessions and we father mike will try to answer some of those questions um but as now we invite him to just give us a summary of the, the first two sessions um as before we go into the the question and answer session so i invite um father mike to to um, share with us. Praise God and peace be with you. And thank you so much for being part of this. Praise God. So what I'd like to do before I start off answering questions, I just want to do a, a quick review as it were of what we've covered. As I said at the very beginning, we're covering something that people take volumes to write about and we're only covering one aspect of it. There's so much more I suppose that we can learn, you know, and, uh, and to celebrate about, about the Mass. So just a, a review of what we did. So first of all, we, we saw that the, the Mass has two main parts, liturgy of the Word, liturgy of the Eucharist. And then before these two, there's some introductory rites and then some concluding rites. So in other words, there, there are four parts, the two main parts, liturgy of the Word, liturgy of the Eucharist. And the Church reminds us that these two are so closely interconnected that they form one act of worship, the Word, and the and the and the um, table of the and the and the Eucharist. <clears throat> so, 
First of all, after that, then we looked at the opening rites, which, as you remember, is the entrance procession, the veneration of the altar, the greeting, the penitential, the gloria, the opening prayer. And just to remind you of their purpose, the general instruction of the Roman Missal in Article 46 says, their purpose, there being the opening rites, their purpose is to ensure that the faithful who come together as one establish communion and dispose themselves properly to listen to the word of God and to celebrate the Eucharist with you. So, so two, two uh, things to help dispose us, to, to get us ready as it will, to enter into the liturgy of the word and the liturgy of the Eucharist, but also to, to help us establish communion with one another. Because we remember that when we come in before God in the Mass, we come in before God not as a set of individuals, but as God's people, brothers and sisters in the Lord. It's been so from the, from the beginning that God has called a people and called a people to worship. We live, we live our lives as individuals as it will during the week. And then we gather on the Sunday or the Saturday evening as, as needs be. We gather to give God worship, to give God praise, to come into communion with the Lord and with one another. So, so that's what these opening rites are about. The penitential, which um, prepares us as a church to move forward. Because you know, we can't come into God's presence with loaded down by sin. We have to come before the Lord acknowledging our sinfulness, acknowledging that, that who are we after all, you know? So, so, so that, that the, the penitential right, you know, prepares us for this to move forward. As Moses had to take off his shoes before he moved forward to the burning bush. As Isaiah's lips had to be cleansed before he could say, Lord, here I am. And as Psalm 14 and Psalm, uh, sorry, Psalm 15 and Psalm 24 remind us, who can enter the tent of the Lord? Who can climb his holy mountain? Only the person with pure heart and clean hands. So the penitential to help us may be, may be freed to move forward. And then we move forward into the glory to give God praise, except, of course, in Advent and in, and in Lent, to give God praise. And, and the glory made up of, of praising the Father. We, do, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you. Then praise of, of, of Jesus and also petition to Jesus for mercy. You alone are the Holy One. You are the Lord. Have mercy on us. And then our doxology, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we praise and we bless you. A wonderful hymn of praise. You know, sometimes we, sometimes, I can't remember if I said this the first time or not, but you know, sometimes, you know, we, 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 we enter into this gloria with less enthusiasm than we might enter into some, some hymns and, and some, um, some choruses and so on. But to remember what it is we're singing, praises to God. And then the opening prayer, and then we enter into one of the two main parts of the Mass, the word and the importance of the word. Our faith is based on the word. The very fact we celebrate the Eucharist is because we have the word. Do this in memory of me. And, and we, we read what Jesus said and did. You know, so, so, so that the, the word is of utmost importance to us. And because of such importance, uh, we saw that the church has, has, has tried to give us as much as possible of the word. So over a three year period in, in um, on Sundays, we, we do the Gospels, with, of course, the first and second readings filling in a lot of the word. On weekdays, we get through the, all the Gospels in one year. And they're all spread out for us like a buffet, if you wish, a rich fare for us to come and choose, uh, to come and listen, to come and eat, to come and receive, to come and be nourished by this word of God. And we saw that the word of God also um, consists of the homily, which is a... a uh, an explanation which has an, an embellishment, an application of the word to our lives. Though, though, though they normally be so, and most priests don't do this, I, don't, I think. Um, so it can also be uh, something on part of the Mass or, or part of one of the prayers of the Mass. The homily can also be based on that. Then after that, the creed. So we've heard the word and we want to show that we adhere to the word, that, that, that we believe in this word. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. We believe in this. We, we are people of the word and we believe in all that the word has revealed to us. And then our response to all this is, is we, we pray. But Lord, you who are our God, you will reveal all this to us in the word. Come and, come and help your church. Come and help the world. Come and help our country. Come and help all those in need. And that brings us to the end, the first major part of the Mass. And then we come to the second major part, the liturgy of the Eucharist. And this, of course, has different parts, just like the liturgy of the word. 
and, and, and it's part, well, first of all, the preparation of gifts, which involves the, the procession outside of pandemic time, the procession, the, 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 the placing of the bread and wine on the altar, the prayers, like the grace before meals, blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, and then the, the invitation to pray. Pray, my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God the Father. So just a few things about that. You know that, that, that what we're doing here is that a few people, two, three, four people maybe, are bringing up the bread and wine to, to, the, to the altar. But in fact, they're doing it on our behalf. So that all of us are offering something to the Lord. And what we're coming before the Lord with is these gifts of bread and wine that are symbols of our whole lives. And, and, and we're giving you know, our daily bread uh, the, the, the wine, all the excesses, the joys, the triumphs of our lives, whatever. We come in before the Lord because we're going, we're going to represent, as it will, re remember the make memorial of the offering of Jesus to the Father. Jesus' whole life was a cross. So we come in to, to offer this, well, no, sorry, to, to make memorial of this offering. And therefore, we come in to unite our, the offering of our lives. May my sacrifice and your sacrifice be accepted. We offer it with Jesus. So that through Jesus and in Jesus and with Jesus in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor may be given to God. So it's, 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 a, it's a part, it's not the major part of the Christian Eucharist, but it's an important part. You know, as we, we, we come to, to prepare ourselves as a group for offering. And then after that comes the Eucharistic prayer. The Lord be with you, lift up your hearts, Holy, holy, right down to the great amen. And this, this prayer, which has its difficulties because it's a long prayer, and, and sometimes people can't, you know, their attention you know, tends to be distracted at times. Even the priests um, who sing the prayer sometimes is, you know, I, I know I have to concentrate, I know I have to focus. Otherwise, my mind goes this way, that way. So I have to have my, my, my mind focused on what I'm praying and what I'm doing. So, so the Eucharistic prayer has many different parts. It has to be thanksgiving. We do well always and everywhere. It's our duty, our salvation. Lift up your hearts. Holy, holy, holy. We, we, we give God thanks. We give God thanks also in the, in the rest of the prayer. But we, that's a major part. And then also it involves, it involves the, um, the, the, into what we call the institution narrative, what Jesus did before, the night before he died, and the, the consecration. And then after, the, and then we have the, the offering. We offer you in, in, in this memorial, the saving passion of your son, his glorious resurrection and ascension into heaven. And then there's a prayer for unity. We all of us who share the body and blood of Christ be brought together in unity by the Holy Spirit. And then, and then there is a, a prayer, prayers of petition, prayers of remembering, Prayers of praying for the church, the world, those who died for ourselves, and so on. So the prayer it has a lot in it, and it's a wonderful prayer because we are offering to the Lord, we're remembering, we're making memorial of the death and resurrection of Jesus, and we're saying, Lord Jesus, you who are great, you who are glorious, you who are our God, you've done all these things for us, oh Father. Come now and, and bless your church, bless the world, bless us through Him, with Him, in Him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours. And then the people are praying, Amen. And then just mumbled, Amen. That's really an acclamation, Amen, Amen. We're, we're approving of this. We're uniting ourselves with this prayer. And then we come to the next part of the um, following part of the which is the Eucharist, which is the communion rite. So, so. So the word has built up as it were, like, like the, the disciples on the way to Emmaus, they heard the word, the word built within them, then they wanted to move to the next section, so they came to the table. The liturgy Eucharist, Jesus broke the bread and, 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 and they recognized him. You know, and, and so, so there's that movement from, from this word now, from, from the word now to the liturgy Eucharist. And as part of this liturgy Eucharist, we come to the communion, right? They are our Father, they deliver us all from every evil, the um, prayer for peace, the sign of peace, the Lamb of God, and the reception of communion and prayer to communion. And even in this, there's that, there's that movement, you know, because what are we coming to? We're coming to this high point. We're coming into communion with Jesus. St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 15 and 16 or 16 and 17, 
is he says, he says, yeah, as we come into communion with a, with a cup, as we receive of the cup, we come into communion with the blood of Jesus, and as we receive of the loaf, we come into communion with the body of Christ. And then as, because there's only one loaf, we come into communion with one another. So this is the high point of our unity and our peace, because we're in communion with the Lord, communion with one another, a, a, a sign of, of heaven, a sign of that oneness with God and with one another in the joy and unity of heaven. We come into it, so, so, so we pray for peace, grant us peace in our days. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, peace I need you. Peace in the Lord, we will be a sign of peace. The Lamb of God, with his prayer for us, grant us peace because we come into this tremendous sacrament of unity. And so, so, so there's that movement too. So we come to this high point as it were, of when we come into communion with the Lord, with one another. Now, now, I know very often the consecration is seen as the high point, and which it is, it is a high point. You know? but, but why are we consecrated bread and wine? To receive them, so that Jesus can share with us his body and blood. We can be nourished for the journey. We can receive the bread and, 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 and the body and blood of Jesus. Jesus says, as we do this, we have eternal life. So, we, so, so this, this even builds up as we go to communion where, where this is, is ratified and we're sanctified in communion. We come to receive the, 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 the body and blood of Jesus. And as I mentioned at the end of the last session, I've forgotten it in the body of what I was saying. You know, but I, I think it's an important point. Just before we receive communion, you know, uh, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, which of course is the words of John the Baptist. Blessed are those who, who come to are invited to the table of the Lamb. Now these words, as I mentioned, are from Revelation 19, 19, when John is having a vision. And he's a vision of having of the wedding feast about to take place. And all these people coming, all these people who've been, as it was saved by the blood of the Lord, coming to this wedding feast of the Lord. And, and they're going to you know, celebrate. And so the angel tells, says, says to John, Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. And we use those words at this point. Why? Because this is a, a sign of glory divine. A sign of what's going to happen and what this was going to lead to. This is, a, as it were, a rehearsal, a practice, if you wish, for heaven. Where we'll be one with the Lord and one with one another. Here on earth, this is the closest we can come when we come in with the Lord and one with one another. So truly blessed, happy are we who are called to the supper of the Lamb. And then we come to the, after the prayer, after communion, we come to the concluding rites. So we finish the opening rites, the two main parts of the Mass, the liturgy of the, of the Word, the liturgy of the Eucharist, and now we're going to go out, because this is what's all leading up to, in a sense, our going out now into the world. So we are, we are dismissed, we are sent out into the world. We receive the blessing as we do, and now we go. And, and what are we going to do? To bring out into the world what we celebrated in here our communion, our unity to celebrate it out there. Our, our, our service, because we're celebrating in the very heart of, 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 our, of our celebration, we're celebrating the sacrifice of Jesus. Did he come to serve and not to be served? And then we have to live that out outside. If we celebrate it in here, we have to live it out out there. So this becomes a mockery. And then the, 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 the thanksgiving that we've celebrated to celebrate it out there and so on. So we've got to live out and be sent out on mission as it were out there to, to, to bring to the world Jesus Christ whom we have received. So then we go out and we live our lives, our whole week trying to live that out, trying to live as best we can, trying to give every day a sacrifice of our lives to the Lord. And then when the next weekend rolls around, we gather again, the people of God coming from all the different events of the week and all the different things that they've celebrated and done during the week, we gather again and we celebrate again. Some we take bread, we take wine after we listen to the word, we give thanks, we break, we share, we go out. And so our lives go punctuated as a word all these Sundays, all these weekends with this great act, this great, great act of communion, this, this, this nourishment, this celebrating. And we journey through our lives filled and nourished by this. And then we come to heaven, the wedding feast of the Lamb. 
happy at those calls. We were willing to sow the lamb, the supper of the lamb. So as a quick run through, I should be embarrassed to, to talk about the mass in such a, a short way because it's worth so much more. But that was a quick run through, a quick review of what we uh, have, have celebrated, sorry, what we, we've shared in the last two weeks. So when I um, open to questions, so you have sent in questions and I turn it over to Gary. Thank you, Thank you very much, Montigno. Um, I think um, even though it was a quick run through, I think it was comprehensive. I think it covered all the, the aspects of what you went into the, the detail over the last two sessions. So thank you very much for that, um, that summary, as it were. And I know that um, the feedback I've been getting, um, certainly some of my the parishioners in, in, in where I worship um, have been joining us, those from the, the um, hospitality group and the, 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 the comments were very appreciative of the explanation. So I know um, there, there is benefit in, in the session and your information and your explanations. But there are some questions. And I'll try and deal with the, the simple ones first, and then we'll go to the more um, maybe complex ones after, or where you, you, you may have to, to go into a lot of detail. So one, one quick explanation that was required or requested is, what is the meaning of the term mass? And, and I can't remember, we, we discussed it in, in the session, but maybe if you did, we, we may have missed it. But what is the meaning of the term mass? And I will add the other one to that, this, this, this controversial thing about uh, why we, we, we celebrate on the Sunday. You know, we people like to, to comment on Catholics and, and our way. And uh, you, you all are doing it the wrong way. Not Sunday is not the day of worship, it's Saturday, or, you know. So those two questions. Okay, well, the... First question of the name of the mass. Well, you know, the mass has many names. The first mass, the first name was breaking of the bread. And then we read our St. Paul calling it in 1 Corinthians 11, the Lord's Supper. So these were the two earliest names for the mass. It's gone through a, a number, the sacrifice of the mass, you know, the, um, all sorts of different names for, for, for the Eucharist, including the Eucharist. We are, the way word mass appears to have come from the dismissal, which tells us how important the dismissal is. You know, it comes from, from the dismissal, which in Latin was ite misa es. Go, you are sent. And so, and so that was sent, misa, like missile, a missile is something sent, misa. Give the, give, give the, 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 the whole mass its, its name, but we know it as of today, the mass, which is a reminder to us of the importance of the sending out and the importance of the whole thing. It's, it's so we may be sent out. To give to, to, into the world to give praise to God by how, how we live, you know, and, and how we sanctify the world. So, so that's basically where that 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 word has come from. The um, ite misaes. Some of you may still remember that. That was the only dismissal. Now we have about four or five dismissals. Go and announce the good news. Go, masses ended. Go in peace and so on. The um, but before there was just this one. Ite go. Um, ite misaes. You're dismissed. The second question was um, was on the the Sunday worship, worship on the Sunday. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Gary said that he's leaving the complicated questions for last. It was landed a complicated question. The second, yeah, um, <laughs> it's a very complicated question. Actually, the certainly the in the um, the and I'll give you a, such a brief answer that it will be maybe a, a, a little too simple. The um, well, for the Israelites, for the Jewish people, Saturday was the day of rest, the Sabbath. Jesus celebrated the Sabbath. He went to the synagogue, the gospel tells us, on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. Now, along the line somewhere, and it's still a little unclear exactly when, along the line somewhere, but it begins in, in scripture. So in, in scripture, we see things happening on the first day of the week, which is a Sunday, the resurrection of Jesus, the sending forth of the Holy Spirit on the first day of the week. 
we read in, in Revelations in chapter one, that uh, John was, when John received his revelation, it was on the first day of the week. In Acts of the Apostles, they were praying on the first day of the week. So the first day of the week took on, because of, because of the resurrection, took on um, a very, very important place in, in Christian practice. Um, for a while, Christians were doing both. They were going to the Sabbath on, they were going to the synagogue on the Sabbath and, and the, the, the house to celebrate um, on, on, on the first day of the week. Then it came a time when they could no longer do that because the, the um, Jews were very angry with them and persecuting them and so on. So they were not allowed in the synagogues anymore. And so, so, so bit by bit, and it took about, about maybe two, three hundred years for, for it to be fully on the day of, of the first day of the week. But we do have some very ancient documents. So, for example, there's one called the Didache. The Didache is from, well, difficult to say, the Didache probably, uh, people dated the last 20 years of the first century and the first 20 years of the second century. So somewhere around the end of the first century. So it's our earliest Christian writing outside of the Bible. And he says that, he says, on the day of the Lord, or actually he emphasizes it, on the Lord's day of the Lord, the first day of the week, they, they would gather on that day. So from very early, it, it is a day of gathering. Then in the year 150, we have another document from which I may talk about a little later again, from um, Justin the Martyr, the year 150, in which he writes that on the first day of the week, so he gives an account of, of the Eucharist. He says, on the first day of the week, the people gather from country and city and they listen to the word and they give thanks and they break bread and so on. So, so it, it, is, it is clear that the early church tra transferred that day of worship. And of course, I mean, the Lord chose the Sabbath, so chose the Sunday, the first day of the week, he chose it for, for a new life, a new covenant, a new life, a new everything. The, the world was made new by Jesus' death and resurrection. And part of that newness now was the first day of the week. That sign of newness, that sign of beginning, that sign of opening up into something new. The day of resurrection, the day of new life. And, and so very briefly, as I said, this is, this is how we have transferred to the, uh, from, from the Sabbath to the Sunday, the Christian Sunday. Thank you. Thank you, Father Mike, for that explanation. Um, one other question. You, you talked about, again, in, in the first session, and, and, and you, you mentioned it again, that the Mass is one, is a unit that brings us together, that the liturgy of the Word and the Eucharist make up the Mass. Now, often in the celebration of the Mass, we see a lot of time spent on the liturgy of the Word. So if we have a our mass, we may spend 40 minutes, 45 minutes on the liturgy of the word and a shorter time on the Eucharist. How does that, you know, what is that saying about the importance of one or the other? And how does that, um, you know, emphasize Okay. The, the, the unity of the, 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 the mass as one when we spend more time on the other. Right, right, right. Well, well it's a tricky um, thing. Yeah, yes, um, the liturgy of the word leads to the liturgy of the Eucharist, but it is an important part also. And, and so we can't really say this is more important than that. Yeah. But what? I, I, and you're right, there are some occasions when the liturgy of the word goes on for a very long time. I mean, I remember going to one where the whole thing was, the whole thing was, it wasn't, it wasn't the, um, the Passion Sunday or Good Friday, where then you have long readings, but the, the readings were drawn out because they were acted out and, you know, and a skit on each part and so on and so on and so on. We have a little problem with the skits, but during Mass, but anyway, that's a different story. Yeah. So, 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 yes, you know, how, and this brings the question, how long should a homily be? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a difficult one to answer. Mm -hmm. um, the U.S. bishops put out a document some years ago on the homily. Um, and, and they said 10 to 12 minutes. The, um, Pope Francis goes anywhere from eight to 12 minutes. Um, there are others who say, what? Now, now I know that in another Caribbean country, we shall remain nameless. You know, if you don't give a, a 40 minute comedy, 
I don't want to get any collection at all. You know, they, they expect their money's worth as it were. You know? Yeah, I'll, I'll waste my time to come for, <laughs> for an yes. hour. I need to yes, be here yes. for two hours. <laughs> so, so we have to be careful. But the world does not overshadow the Eucharist. You know, so, so I mean, now the world is, is an important part of the, of the Mass. And, and, and because it's one part that varies, the homily can vary, unlike in the, the, the ritual. You know, it's a part that, that, that people um, will remember and, and enjoy, but depending on who's preaching and what they're preaching about, you know, they will enjoy. So it's so a very, uh, uh, you know, people will say, a good homily when they're going out. They never say a good Eucharistic prayer or anything like that. You know, so this homily is commented on. But you have to be careful. You have to see it as part of something. And it's not something on its own. You know, um, so, so, so that, that, for example, somebody said the other day, come, come to this mass. Um, that's some visiting priest. We are dynamic priests, you know, which meant that he's going to give a dynamic homily. But what about the rest of the mass? You know, is it, is it any worth? You know, so we do have to be careful. So I can't give a counsel definitely this is how long it should be. You know, people have different ideas and so on. But we have to be careful that it does not become seen as the most important part. Thank you, thank you for that. And 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 yes, and and people are exposed to different kinds of um, different times styles and, so on, and, so on, yeah. and styles. Yeah. And so, so thanks for that. Um, so let me go to uh, this question that came in on 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 the net on the email, and it go. I'll I'll read it word for word, so I don't um, you know try to interpret the question myself. There is the bowl with water that the priest's fingers are dipped in and washed, as he says, a, pr a prayer during the Eucharistic section of the Mass. After Mass, should it be dispersed in any plant, for example, the pot that holds a plant near the altar or down a drain or in the root of a plant in the ground? What is the proper or correct way to disperse of that water and why? And I will add, I, I mean, I remember in the early days as an altar server um, that we used to use, a, not a bowl, eh? it was a small um, glass yeah. platter and the water would be there and we, would, we couldn't drop it on the way to dispose of it down a special sink in the sacristy that, was, that, that we learned that we had to pour that water down. And we, it, it, we were told that it did not go into the sewer or, or, or the drains, it went into the earth. And I, so, you know, that just came to mind while I was reading the question again. So, your Okay, response. well, there, 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 there's um, two times that the, the priest uses the water, okay? Now, when he, when he, um, when he, uses the water the first time to put a drop into the wine. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, when he washes his hands, okay? Um, th that does not become holy water because the priest touches it. Okay, the priest is not making a blessing over it. He's not praying over it. He's washing his hands. He does say a prayer actually when he's washing his hands. You know, um, wash me, O Lord, from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Okay, when he's washing his hands. So it's a symbol of... of being interiorly cleansed for what the priest is going to do or for the sacrifice. You know? But the water in itself is not, not holy. The water is just water that somebody has washed their hands in. They, um, so it, it can be, I mean, probably some very thirsty um, pots or rises in, in the sanctuary that they, it could be added to. It could be just poured into the ground so it could be poured away because it's not, it's not holy water. And it's not made holy by the touch of the priest. They, um, now, the second time you, the priest will use water is, is when he's going to, um, to, to uh, well, not the second, there's another time too, but he, when he's going to wash the, the chalice at the end of communion. So he um, puts, um, he cleanses the ciborium, the pattern, whatever it is there, and whatever little particles supposedly go into, and then he, he um, pours water into the chalice to cleanse it. But he drinks the water. Because it's quite, it has all these little particles of the, of the host in it, you know. Um, so other than that, yeah, yes, we, we may have paid a little bit too much attention to it in the past. Okay. Good. 
and keeping in you know on these little practices these yeah. practical things that we do um some questions came in so let's go to those now and maybe clarify um what the thinking is or what the teaching is um so do we kneel during the consecration and also at the lamb of god and why okay um about kneeling I'm sorry, I'm not doing too clearly, but, but you asked about oh, kneeling during yeah. consecration, right? Yeah, okay. do we kneel and, and during the consecration? Yeah, okay. do, do yeah, consecration. Yes, right. Okay, got it. Okay, do we <laughs> kneel during the consecration and also the Lamb of God, and why? Well, it's different in different places. So you said we, so we're going to come to their search diocese in a short while. But just know that, the, the, uh, in, for example, in the general instruction of the Roman Missal, it says that that you you stand from the from the from the beginning of pray brothers and sisters until the end of mass except for communion of course and after communion you can kneel or sit so you stand throughout the eucharistic prayer you stand throughout the lamb of god right? that's the, Ro the roman pattern all right in the united states they do something different in the united states they kneel from from holy 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 until the amen and then they kneel again after that so so and then here we we stand from the holy, holy, holy. Well, you know, for the Lord, you lift up your hearts. Um, the and we, we kneel for the consecration and again for the Lamb of God. Okay, so different places do it differently. The um, kneeling for for the for basically kneeling is a, is a sign of when when might one kneel? One might kneel when one's very repentant. One might kneel when one is. Asking, you know, you have the, the traditional cartoon figure of the young man kneeling or, or genuflecting at least before the fiance with a ring in his hand, you know. So, so imploring, you know, you, or you may fall to your knees begging for somebody to do something. But, but kneeling is also a sign of reverence before holiness, okay. Now, yes, Jesus is present on the altar, but there are these times when Jesus is held up to, to be looked at, you know. So, uh, um, so, so, um, the, the, the priest will hold up the, the, the bread and wine at the consecration, and then again at the Lamb of God, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Okay, so the, 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 the priest is showing you, behold the Lamb of God. So at these times, when, when, when the, 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 the sacrament is held up for us to, 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 to look at, we fall to our knees as it were. All right, in, in reverence before this great holiness. And that's basically why, why we do it. You know, the, um, the Lamb of God, in, in Rome, once again, as I mentioned, and a lot of other places, they, they just remain standing. Here, here we, we need it for that too, because, well, once again, it's a sign of penitence, and remember what's happening at, at, at the woods. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. So, so we, are, we are asking for forgiveness. We are asking for something. So we should, kneeling is a sign of repentance and of, of asking. And then we remain kneeling because we're going to reverence the, 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 the um, elevated host and cup. Yep. And in some places it's out of necessity because some parishes have just chairs, no kneelers. Yes. Although, yeah. And all those and, and I've read somewhere where standing is a is a proper form of um, of prayer stands for prayer. It, it is. You see, we, we used to we, we used to, to, to kneel throughout the whole Eucharistic prayer as they do in the states. Um, when the Eucharistic prayer was seen basically as as a, as a, a sacrificial prayer, um, but but. With the recovery of, the, of, of it being a prayer of sanctification, a prayer of thanksgiving, you know, the, the, the posture has, has changed to, to one of, of standing. And standing is a re very reverential thing, it's attention and so on. But, um, but, 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 but yes, there's some places that have uh, here and elsewhere who have not um, put in kneelers for different reasons, you know, yeah. in, in places. But you see, I, I, sometimes even in those situations, you have people kneel and, and we shouldn't, you know, get the impression that, um, that, that kneeling is, is the preference. But because we don't have the kneelers, um, we stand. 
Right. Uh, you know, you know, and your explanation does yeah, say that yeah. you can either kneel or stand. Right, right. right. Um, so another question, is our sacrifice also the cross or crosses or suffering we also bear? Is our sacrifice also the crosses or suffering we also bear? Yes, the sacrifices of our daily lives sometimes, and the sacrifice of, you know, we, we, we go through the suffering, we go through maybe with, 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 with illness and so on. All that is part of our, our all that is part of our, um, our sacrifice. May my sacrifice and your sacrifice be acceptable. The sacrifice is everything about our lives. You know, whether it's suffering, whether it's crosses we bear, whether it's joys and triumphs, successes, whether it is the daily grind of life, whatever it is, everything about our life. You know, is offered as that sacrifice, and, and certainly, um, certainly, crosses, crosses, and suffering may be a very privileged part of that of that um, offering that sacrifice to the Lord. Mm -hmm. oh. So th this one continues. I have noticed a lot of practices which have crept in the mass over time, which I never did when I was growing up, and still do not do. Maybe it's not important, but it seems to be the norm now. For instance, genuflecting and making the sign of the cross at the same time. Leaving during Mass without genuflecting or bowing. Raising our hands during the Gloria. Making the sign of the cross after receiving the body of Christ. And there may be okay. more. Yeah, there may well be more. Yeah. <laughs> the, okay. So, movement is part of our worship. And movement symbolizes something. So, we just have to be careful about it. We just finished talking about kneeling and standing and sitting. Well, kneeling and standing and so on. Okay. Um, so, I'll just, let me just address these specific points here. Now, um, now, some people have their own sort of piety. They might do. Um, and it shouldn't bother us, right? Um, so, for exa example, genuflecting and making the sign of the cross at the same time. Now, theoretically, it shouldn't be done, not because there's anything wrong with it, but you see, when you genuflect, what is your point? What's your focus? Your focus is God. The genuflecting in the presence of the holy. So you're giving God a certain worship at that time as a group. And making the sign of the cross at the same time is asking for a blessing of yourself. You see, so, so one part of you is, is, is offering to, uh, to God the reverence, and the other part of you is, is uh, asking for a blessing. Now, in one sense, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I don't think anybody's going to go to hell because of it. But, but uh, um, yes, theoretically, we do, we do one or the other. Yeah. You see, the, the blessing... You see, now the, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen, is, is, is a blessing. You're, you're asking for God you know, to, to do something. You, you, so you, begin, so you begin with the sign, some of the sign of the cross, you end it with the sign of the cross. Um, so, the, so, 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 the, like, so, like when you enter the church, I mean, it was the practice, uh, it still is, and now because of COVID, we don't use the holy water. Right. We bless right. ourselves with the holy right. water. And that, right. at that point, you make it. Right, right, right. So the sign so of the cross is seen as a religious act, you know? So I don't think when, when somebody's genuflecting, making the sign of the cross, they're necessarily seeing that difference between the two at all. It's all a part of active devotion. Mm -hmm. They are leaving during mass without genuflecting or bowing. Well, people leave mass for all sorts of reasons. Um, leaving during mass. So, so first of all, you shouldn't leave during mass. But some people, of course, are going to leave through the bathroom, some people because they're sick, whatever the case might be. Um, and certainly, once again, we should, just like when we come into the church, when we're leaving the church, we should perform some act of worship. You know? now, now, the church tells us that if the tabernacle is in the sanctuary, so the sanctuary is that area where, where the priests and the ministers are, you know, um, and it has the altar, the, 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 the lectern, the chair, and so on. Um, but if the tabernacle is there, then you, you genuflect when you come in. If, if the tabernacle is not there, you bow. So, for example, um, a church that has the, the tabernacle on the side, which is not in the sanctuary, when you come up, so even when the priest comes up, for example, it's not on a genuflect, you're going to bow because it's not in the sanctuary. 
Okay. Now, if he crosses in front of the tabernacle for some reason, you know, he's going to, you know, the, the person will, will, will genuflect. Okay. So, so yes, there should be a genuflection. There should be a vow on, on coming into your pew and leaving your pew um, as a sign of reverence. You know, we can't forget what we're here about and you know, where we are. The, um, the raising our hands during glory. Well, this is a difficult one because the church says nothing about it. The church doesn't say, lift your hands, hold your hands, fold your hands, make, you know, in this position and so on. So the church doesn't say anything about it. I think what has happened here, and I may be very wrong, is that, that the charismatic influence, you know, of, of raising hands in praise it, it has influenced this action in church. You know, it's a, a raising of the hands in praise to God. And, and scripture, scripture speaks about that, you know, the, the, the motions of, of, of praising God and so on. So, um, so as I said, there's nothing I can find that says, do not raise your hands during the glory. There's nothing I can find that says, raise your hands during the glory. It's not, a, it's not traditional. Okay. Um, as as the, the, um, the question is, the question says, you know, I'm not accustomed to these things when I was growing up. Well, neither was I, you know. The, um, the, the, but it's something that's come in and, well, I'm not sure, we, I tell you the truth, I don't know where we're going with this one. You know, they, they raise their hands because it's become part of our, of our religious culture right now. Participation. The, um, making the sign of the cross after receiving the body of Christ. Well, once again, there's nothing that says you do and nothing that says you don't. We're not accustomed to it. You know, when we receive the body of Christ, it is a blessing. So, you know, in, in one sense, making the sign of the cross after it is redundant, you know, and, 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 and small compared to what we've just done. You know, so we don't need to do it, certainly. Once again, because the sign of the cross has become this act of piety, it simply means, I don't know what it means, closeness with God or whatever, um, it's done. But, the, but there's no real reason for it to be done. Because, because we just come into communion with the Lord. A blessing is supposed to bring us into communion with the Lord. But we come into communion with the Lord through the reception of it. So there's, so there's no need for the... Um, so so that, that's something that, yes, we can, we can um, do without that one. Is, is there anything you would have noticed from the altar that people do that um, may, may not have been done in the past but has now come into our practice, our norms? Um, which you know you may want to address. Well, offhand, I can't think of any. The, um, the other than those that have been mentioned, you know, the, the most obvious one I see is the raising of the hands of the Gloria. The um, the other one was the holding of the hands of the Alpha, which we don't do anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can't say I see any others now. Yeah. But from our side now, we see you kiss the altar. What? What? Why is that happening? Why, why the kissing of the altar at the beginning is a sign of reverence again. And why, why are we revering this piece of furniture? Well, because it's a symbol of Christ. Um, during the prayer of dedication of an altar, the, 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 the bishop says that the altar is Christ because the altar is anointed. Okay, and Christ was anointed. The word Christ means anointed one. So the altar is anointed and, and the bishop says the altar is Christ. So it's a symbol of, of Christ in our midst. So, so we, the, the priest at the beginning of a celebration, priest and deacon, kiss the altar as a sign of, of, of reverence for the altar. Is there, I mean, I've heard the altar sometimes contains relics of, of saints, especially if they were the, the saint of the church. Is that, is that um, true? Is it norm? Yeah, no, is I don't know. I don't think so because there are many altars, of course, I don't have. Yeah. Um, the, yeah, no, I don't, I don't think it's related. No, it's, a sign, it's a sign of reverence for the altar. Mm -hmm. But do some altars contain relics? Some altars do have relics. Now, some have, now, some altars do have relics. At one stage, every altar had to have relics. Um, it may come from the thing in the book of Revelation, so it says the, the bones of the saints were below the altar. Um, the, but it's not, it's not a, a, a requisite anymore. And it does say that if you have, if you have relics, they have to be um, authentic, you have to be able to prove, and, um, and they have to be, it can be a little 
chip of bone of it, you, know, you can't tell what it is. You know? It's so small that you can't, you can't tell what it is. Um, so, so, yes, um, all used to have to have it. It's not a re uh, requirement anymore. Um, so we did talk about the priest putting a drop of water into the, the cup, the wine, um, before the consecration and preparation. But we didn't say why, and we noticed that from our side. Why, why does the priest put that okay, drop well, of wine? Water? The easy answer is because Jesus did it. So we know that because that is how the, 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 the Jewish people consume the wine. It was always diluted with a little bit of water. And, and so from the very beginning, you know, when, when, we, when we read about, about the gifts coming up, they say wine and a little water. You know, so, so it's, it's become, it's, it's, it's traditional because of that. However, however, it has taken on a, a, a spiritual sense, just like the priest washing his hands and he's praying for him that internal cleansing, that interior cleansing. You know, the, the mixing of the water and, and the wine in the chalice um, also is, is, is spiritualized. So, so there's, a, there's a prayer there again, you know, when, when the priest is putting the, the, the water in the wine, um, he, he prays, by, by the mystery of this water and wine, may we come to share in the divinity of Christ who humble themselves to share in our humanity. So, so the water is a sign of our humanity, the wine is a sign of Jesus' divinity. And we mix it into and we pray that um, by this mystery that we're celebrating, you know, the, um, that we will share in the divinity of Christ, who among themselves to share our humanity. Divinity and humanity, the water and the wine, or the wine and the water. Right. So we, we again remembering the that Jesus is true God and true man in that in that act. What about the, the there's also that breaking of the, the the bread and putting a little bit into the cup. What what's okay. what is symbolism of that? Okay, so so um, the, the the priest break, breaks the bread because yeah. so that's what Jesus did. So he had to break bread to share it, and so so he breaks the bread and he puts a little piece into the chalice. Now we don't know exactly when why, why this was done. Okay, there's nothing nothing recorded that says why this was done. Um, so the, the 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 usual explanation given is that. The, um, that the the just to symbolize the the oneness of um of of the body and blood. So so the prayer now that goes with it, because um, in all the, in all these little things, you know, as I mentioned with the other two, um, there's a prayer, and the, and this prayer is the, um, may this mingling of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Bring eternal life to us to receive it. May this mingling of the body and blood of Christ bring eternal life to us to receive it. Okay, so um, the church believes in what we call concomitance, which means that when you receive of one, you receive of both. When you receive of, of, of the, the, the bread, you receive of the, uh, the body, you receive of the, of the blood of Jesus. So you can't separate the two. So concomitance. However, I have no idea if this is where it comes from, but this may well be the root in Latin. But I think of it in Spanish, con, with, comer, to eat. Eating with, when eating the bread, you, you have it, you have it with, with the blood and so on. Um, that was not very scholarly, but don't mind. The, um, well, no, this isn't. The, um, the, so we receive a both. But so, so the mingling is a sign that the, the two are one. And the prayer goes that, that, that we who receive the body of Jesus will uh, come to will, will, um, receive eternal life. So... Um, at one stage, uh, some people uh, and people still hold that this was breaking off, not as he dipped in the chalice, but so the bishop to, as a sign of unity. So here would be the bishop in, in Port of Spain um, celebrating mass, and there would be a, 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 a priest celebrating mass or some uh, in, in, in Newtown, in, um, in Belmont, in um, St. Anne's, in, in Mukurapu, and so as a sign of unity. You break off a piece of the, of, of the host that the bishop was using and send it to each one of these churches to um, receive and put in the cup as a sign of unity. 
but they were all shared from one loaf. And so, so the bishop broke off pieces of bread, sent them around. When they received them, they put them in the cup. Mass was celebrated. And so that's a sign of unity. Maybe that's what it was. We don't know. Some people suggest that also. And that was a practice? That? That was a practice? So they say. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. That's interesting. Um, all right. Keeping on the host and the bread. I remember... Well, it would have been during the early liturgy school, the first time an actual loaf, unleavened loaf, brown bread, round, um, like a bake, was used in the, in the mass, in the consecration. It created a bit of stir, the, the brown bread, the, right, the, right, right, the loaf. Right. Uh -huh. The first time I remember it was used at liturgy school in the, in the right. late 70s. And, yes. and it created a bit of stir. Um, it, I, I saw it used several times after that, but uh, in recent years, I have not yeah. been seeing it. it has, yeah. Yeah. You know, is it, is it, was it correct? Was it liturgically correct? Is, uh, well, we, we've what's, gone what's through it? some, um, yes, in, 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 the, in the 80s and 70s and 80s and so you went through some experimentation. Um, now, the brown is not a problem. What else is there is a problem. So the host should be only made of flour and water. Nothing else. No, some people put honey in it. Some people put a little salt in it, whatever the case is. There should be nothing but flour and water. <laughs> you know? um, now, I, I know that, that people have attempted to make their own bread to use. And uh, it's been, they had some, I mean, I remember a master which, first of all, you had a lot of crumbs when you're trying to break this bread. And no yeast in it, so you can't, it, you know, you can't have to, 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 to for the bread to rise. You know, it's just hard, you know. And, um, and the, um, well, people were chewing, 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 and they couldn't swallow it. So everybody burst out laughing one by one, people started to laugh, and it was not a very pleasant experience. But, but yes, so what, it depends what else was put in the brown bread, you know. Um, the, 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 the problem, of course, is, as I say, the yeast and so on. So it, it should be strictly flour and water. Okay, thank you. Um, if it will be flour, it's all right. Oh, okay. One last question. Um, and because we, we just have a couple more minutes, and maybe this is, um, I don't know how deep it's going, but the question, how as Catholics should we approach Mass? How much? How as Catholics should we approach the Mass? How as Catholics should we approach the Mass? Um, I mean, the, the, that's a broad question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, well, well we, we should approach the Mass, I suppose, um, in a lot of different ways. <laughs> you know, um, let me try and... Um, okay, so we, we, we approach the Mass, first of all, with a spirit, hopefully a spirit of joy, that we are, we are, we are, it's the day of the Lord, well, or weekdays too, and we are going to this encounter with the Lord. You know, we're going to this wonderful gift that God has given us, so that we should approach it with a certain joy and a certain reverence, of course, too. And part of that reverence is, is the fasting, which now is only fasting one hour before you receive Holy Communion. Not before the start of Mass, but before you receive Holy Communion. The, um, not that we have to be watching our, our, watching our watches, you know, uh, so, so closely and get too scrupulous. But, but it, is a, it is a sign, once again, of a certain reverence for what we're going to receive. So um, a, a recognition of what it is, this representation of, of, of the sacrifice of Jesus, this, this, this sacred meal, this banquet, you know, um, and, and so, so and we should also approach it with a, a recognition of who we are, that we are the people of God. And, you know, as I think I may have mentioned, you know, we are not the people of, we cannot be identified as the people of God when we are in a mall or a cinema or somewhere, somewhere else. But when we gather to celebrate the Eucharist, we are, we are saying who we are, the people of God. And we have to approach with that also. But this is bearing witness. But this is a sign of my identification. This is who I am. And also, of course, we approach it also with the knowledge that this is how we exercise our priesthood. We, we in baptism, are baptized and anointed as, uh, uh, anointed as priest, prophet, and king. You know, and how do, how do we... How, how we, 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 we show we are, we are we, how we live out our priesthood, this was often God, the, the sacrifice of our lives, but also by joining with Jesus, the head of the body, to offer to the Lord. 
you know, so, so we have to approach it with that sense also, not only who I am as part of this body, but also a, a child of God, one of the people of God, but also a, a holy priesthood, as St. Peter tells us. You know, that, that there's a we in the, um, in the <clears throat> excuse me, we, we, we offer, we're offering sacrifice, we sacrifice our lives, we're remembering the sacrifice, representing the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the memorial of, 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 of his sacrifice. You know, and, and so we're exercising our priesthood, we're offering to God. And so we, we, we approach it also in that sense of who we are. I am a child of God, a person of the covenant. I am a part of our holy priesthood. So with that, 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 that sense of who we are, that sense of preparation also by praying before, by, by, by the short fast before, by the, the reverence and joy we're going towards, all of these ways. I don't know if I'll answer the question, but all these ways we, 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 um, we should approach the Mass, recognizing that it is a jewel that is beyond our understanding. I mean, I, I can't from the depths of the wonder of the Mass that God will come to us and all of the remembering and the calling, the, the, the life, the death, the resurrection, Jesus, and the gift of communion. Thank you Praise very God. much. Thank you very much, Monsignor Mike. We want to bring this to a close now. Thanks for all your questions, Monsignor. Thanks for your, your input, your two powerful lectures and, and your, your responses to the questions that were posed. Thank you very much. Um, I want to remind uh, um, the viewers, like last year, we take a break for Lent because so much is going on in the Archdiocese. We want to allow you the time to participate in, in fully in both at your parish and at your diocese and level. So we, we will have a break um, for Lent and return in May after Easter and we're going straight into um, a powerful series on Marian devotions um, with Father David Pan. So I will take time. We're going to send out the ads soon um, and really mobilize. Mobilize your, your family your friends, your fellow parishioners, your fellow ministry members to really come and join us in understanding um, the, the theology and spirituality in our Marian devotions, which, which, which is so deep in our culture here in Trinidad and Tobago and the, and the Caribbean and Latin America and the world. <laughs> so we, we, we look forward to seeing you there. So Monsignor Mike, could you just close off with a prayer? Praise God. Thank you so much. God bless you all. And that's a nice short prayer it gives us. Thank you. <laughs> Praise God. Okay. Good night and see you all in May. Have a wonderful Lent um, and do enjoy the rest of the week.